Good evening and welcome to another show of Easy Eights Online Painting Club. My name's Danny, it says it right down at the bottom, and we're here for episode 13. It feels like it was just yesterday that we were doing like episode 1, 2, 3 and 4. Um, but yeah, uh, here we are, having a cracking day. Um, it's been an interesting day for me. I've been doing lots of prep work for today. I've got some uh, models all kind of undercoated with my airbrush. I'm uh, really looking forward to doing that in a bit. Uh, we've got Jeff Lacey. Oh, it did say a minute ago that we had a load of viewers in there watching and now it's telling me that there are no viewers in there watching but people are talking Adrian Dean evening all nice to see you all there don't know what's going up with a view count but as long as you're there watching you can hear and see everything that's absolutely fine with me however this evening I am not alone I do have with me Kyle here he is say hi Kyle Hey everyone, good evening nice to see you again mate I haven't seen you all week but we have been talking earlier on how are you doing you all right yeah, I'm good, thank you. And yet again, another busy week. Very busy. We're getting close to half term though, so the the finish the finish line is in sight. We get in there, but no, good week. Looking forward to this. Get some modelling done. Excellent. Yeah, we got we got a change of pace this week, haven't we? We we, um, yeah. we we put up a little thing on the Facebook a little while ago saying uh, like, hey, do you want to see us do something different? And people were like, yeah, 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 sure. And they really want to see tanks. And of course, uh, view count's gone up again. There we go. That's better. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, we were. Um, donated some tanks by one of our viewers actually my dad which is very kind of you there he is jeff lacy right in there in the middle there oi oi he sent us a load of one 100 scale or 15 millimeter tanks um by the company Zvezda. i don't know if anyone's ever heard of that company before i certainly haven't i don't know all the manufacturers for sure but this one I've, i have never heard of um so i thought i, I brought them all along today to kind of show everyone and, and have a little look at them i've got them all sat beside me here all still in their boxes um but i have made one today which was the little matilda uh, infantry tank which um is a really really nice model they are the same scale as all of the little tanks i've done in the past excuse me um but I was wondering about the detail and if that was going to be any different or not and apparently they're absolutely wonderful models it didn't take me very long to make them at all it took me a quarter of the time it took me to do the the other ones that i've been doing um but yeah it's, it's a lovely little tank i think is wonderful um, and it's dwarfed by some of the german armor that i've got here and i'm going to show you all that in a minute but um you got a tank as well yours isn't a british one what did you get i got the t-34 the Russian nice. tank. Um, <laughs> have you fact, ever I seen a guy so happy look Free models. I don't like tanks, but I love models. Mo mo Ooh. Model for tanks. I, I can, you do I can like tanks. That. You just don't I like do. them being in the modern theatre of war, right? And only main battle tanks, as we said before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, they had a very important role. It's, it's a very role. interesting so thing that you mentioned. Fight. That you mentioned main battle tanks, actually, Kyle, is because that um, both the tanks that we're um, playing with today, uh, the Matilda and the T-34 that you got, are at opposite ends of the spectrum. So the yes. um, the Matilda is an infantry tank, which is how tanks were really kind of born to support the infantry on the ground, uh, and off they go. Yours was a little bit of everything, but was pre pretty good at taking out other tanks. Um, and that became then the tank race, like the the, the war to have the, yeah. the best kind of tank that could do everything. Um, which is, so which yeah. makes you laugh because if you then get rid of them, you then don't need tanks. tanks. It really is <laughs> like a war of an arms race. It's exactly what it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. If if there's a vacuum, fill it. If you if you filled it, then you can have a vacuum and get it. Yeah, it was, it was particularly yeah. weird. Um, do you know much about Soviet tanks, Second World War? Do you know much about T thirty four? Um, I know a little bit, and I know obviously we came up against their predecessors in the Gulf Wars as well. Um, yeah. The big thing I always remember with tanks, um, from what I've learned, is the Russian tanks were designed and made so a farmer could repair them with whatever they have on hand. Uh, and that was kind of the ethos behind the, the Russian designs on the tanks. And it, it was a clever one. It meant they had a simple supply line, their logistics were simple for their tanks. Uh, and I know the German tanks obviously had the, the exact opposite problem. Over-engineered. Over-engineered, yeah. yeah. They were incredible Don't get me machines. wrong, beautiful machines. When you take right, away yeah. the, when you take away the fact of it's designed to you know damage and destroy and kill. Um, the engineering in them, fantastic. Yeah. Not great when you're, you realise you're operating in multiple theatres of war and yeah, every you... bit of armour you've got needs different parts. Some of them, they didn't even have a universal fuel, so their supply lines were, oh, 
six years entrenched and they bit off more than they could chew very early basically yeah um and it's interesting you're talking about running out of fuel that the um when the t-34 came out uh the gentleman who designed it mikhail koshkin i believe uh, decided that he wanted to make the tank operate on diesel um because um in soviet russia before the second world war all their previous tanks were infantry tanks um they were uh, people used Molotov cocktails against them, um, and the fire just basically got in around all the weak spots and through all the gaps and vents and hatches and whatever, and just set petrol engines on fire very quickly. But diesel being a slow burning fuel um, just meant that it you know would have less of that problem, um, and it did very very well. Um, I have um, stood beside and um, drooled over and reached out and touched and got to experience the T-34 firsthand. Uh, just at the uh, rear end of last year, I took my dad, Jeff, there he is in the comments. I got to take him to... Uh, yeah, look at that. It's a lovely little model. Great. I got to take I him to... It did take about eight minutes. Uh, I got to take so him to Bovington Tank Museum and we saw T-34 there. And the one thing that really stood out to me is how shoddily it was put together. Like... You expect there to be bits poking out, etc., etc., but there were massive holes, and these weren't bullet holes. This is two bits of metal that are lined up like this, and there's a bit of a weld, and it kind of sticks out, and you're like, I, I literally could put my hand through the back of it up to the shoulder. I'm like, now I can touch the engine. <laughs> it, they they were just making them so fast, they didn't care. They said if you got some, if it's got spiky bits poking off all over it, whatever, it doesn't matter. Why are we even painting them? Get them out there. They weren't lasting that long. So it was uh, the whole, the whole Soviet Union's you know, concept of war, wasn't it? It was that mass yeah. mobility, mass mass mobilization. Sorry, get it all out there and just grind them down. Yeah, numbers it, will tell. But it worked, right? It worked. So what I thought I'd do is I would take us over to the workbench, um, and I will show you all the other tanks that I've got, Kyle. That might make you a little bit jealous that I've got them all. <laughs> But I can't find a button to take us over there. <laughs> so we, we can fill, we can fill, that's not a problem. <laughs> here we go, I'm here, here we are. So, uh, the tank that I got is this little cutie. This is the Matilda. I've undercoated him. I remember the last time I did the tank, I did the little Firefly. I said, oh, I was going to undercoat him. I don't always undercoat my models. I know that's generally a bad thing. If I was doing a really, really posh piece, a big piece, then I certainly would. Um, but I just wanted to see if the airbrush was running earlier on. Um, and I've also got some new primers. And I just thought that I'd just kind of put something on him. So, yeah, I put some primer on it, whatever. Uh, it's a lovely little tank. As you can see, it's tiny here <laughs> in my hands. Um, the Matilda 1, uh, which is the predecessor to this one, um, is half the size. And again, they've got both of the, these examples at that tank museum that we went to. The Matilda 1 it was, was rubbish, basically. It was made before the Second World War. Um, they did take some into the Second World War and realised that you, you pea shooter would take them out very quickly. Um, interestingly enough, for a tank this small, it had some of the heaviest armour that was ever seen in the Second World War, up to 75mm on the front glacis, which is right on the front down here. Glacis, 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 yeah, whatever. The front bit, um, uh, where the Panther in the German army had like 50, 55. Uh, of course, that was beaten by some of the bigger stuff. But yeah, it was, it was a real heavy tank for what it was. It only went about um, 6 miles an hour, maybe a little bit faster than that but it was particularly good at kind of walking in with the infantry it had uh, a little cannon on the top which wasn't really good for much it was a 37 millimeter cannon uh, which was great for taking an infantry but as soon as other vehicles came in there that had any kind of armor it started to slow down in its performance it was given to australia new zealand so on and so forth uh, the australians found it um quite a delight in the pacific jungles where they um, fought against the japanese um, because it went quite slowly you could take the infantry in with it and in close jungle warfare where they were using um anti-armor grenades and other such devices like that um it was great to have it kind of up close anti-infantry weaponry so it did have its uses in fact interesting fact for the matilda it is the only tank in the second world war that was in use right from the very beginning to right at the very end so that kind of tells you a little bit about it 
as far as I know, the crews that did use it enjoyed it. They liked it. Um, and I think it's quite a cute looking, looking tank, especially when you stood beside it. Um, however, I will show you how small it is. Here's the Sherman Firefly. So already you can see the M4 chassis there, which is quite a small tank. It's big when you stood beside it, of course, but it's quite a small tank. Um, and then if I bring over the German Panzer here, uh, you can see, <laughs> again, the size difference there. And then, of course, I've got the uh, the Tiger, which is twice the size, easily, of this poor little Matilda. Um, and, of course, the Tiger had the famous 88, which would just shoot holes through this for a pastime. But it's a lovely little model, and I'm really chuffed to be painting it today. And I'm going to talk about camo schemes, etc, etc. With it. Um, you said you might not be painting yours today because you haven't got that paint for it. Yeah, exactly that. Uh, yeah. In classic, unorganised fashion, went, oh, I need to look in what colours I'm going to need for the paint, and then didn't, and then it got too late to order any in time. So I thought, Do you know what? I've never painted this scale before. It'd actually be quite interesting to watch you today, pick up the tips that I need to, concentrate a bit more on that and on the chat. And then I can do mine next week. Excellent. Um, once I know. Same with me, mate. Same with me. I was going to get some Soviet greens. Uh, very different from all the other greens I've got. Uh, and even though I could kind of make it or just kind of roll with it, I do like all my historical stuff to be as accurate as I can make it within within reason, of course. Um, so I was going to get some Soviet colours. I didn't. I ended up doing a lot of other things. Um, I'll go into those in a minute. Um, so I thought, you know what? I'll do another British one because recently I did the Firefly. I've got the British colours and that's what I'm going to go for. Adrian just pop in, it popped into the comments there. Without the T-34, there would be no Panther. You're absolutely right. And I will go into that in just a moment. But yes, yeah, the Panther is the, is the direct response for the Germans um, uh, encountering the, the Panther. Oh, sorry, the T-34. So here's the little tiny box that the Matilda came in. This is Vesda. It's a Russian company. Uh, their boxes and their um, the little instruction pamphlets are, are, are littered with Russian text all over it. So um, yeah, primarily a Russian company. They do have a game. Um, but I can't remember what it's called. I think it is literally called Tactics or something like that, or Tank Tactics. Uh, oh, the Art of Tactics. There you are. Um, I haven't had a chance to go and have a look at that. Might be interesting to kind of see what it's up, with, what you know, what, what it's all about. I play Tanks, which is the the armor-specific version of Flames of War, and I also play Water Tango, which is just hilarious fun and very tactical. Um, I don't play bolt action or anything like that. Um, but I'd be interested to see what this is about, just to have a little look at least. And as you can see from the back, you can see that there are about three pieces. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And some of those were unnecessary pieces. It's very, very tiny. Like you say, it took you just a couple of minutes to put it together. The best thing about it, though, is it's clipped together. You don't have to use glue. But I did, because I like to. It does suggest maybe you want to in there. Um, so, yeah, that's the Matilda British Infantry Tank. Or the, the Matilda 2, to be precise. I also have to go along with your Russian tanks. Oops, I'm dropping everything now. I have got uh, a KB-1 and I've also got a KB-2. Um, so Soviet heavy tanks. Um, again, I don't know an awful lot about Soviet stuff. Um, I do know that these tanks came before the T-34 because they were basically slower. And if you look at the KB-2 here, you can see that that um, turret on the top is, is basically just a shell magnet as a bullet magnet because it just stands so high profile very very vertical surfaces it's got a howitzer on the top up there uh, but you can see um, sort of designs etc that were reflected in the t-34 um, and the t-34 is basically an improvement on what already existed uh, I also have I like this one the m3 Lee uh, this is the American version uh, which I, I really like it because it's just interesting. It fell out of favour um, with the American troops and British troops alike because it was so tall, because it has a multi-turret setup. Now, its main weapon is actually on the front and it doesn't have a very large arc of fire at all. So for that really big cannon there, it actually had to rotate itself, the whole tank, to really kind of get a good field of view as we would expect that to be on the turret. But the turret is very, very tiny, and it has just an anti-infantry cannon up there. The British uh, took it, they swapped it, they, I think they took out the, the big gun in the back, um, did some additional designs that didn't take an awful lot of effort on the turret, and they called it the M3 Grant. Um, the Americans actually just called it the, the M3 um, medium tank. Uh, it was the British that actually assigned them names of um, generals 
Um, so we in England or you know the UK referred to the American version being the M3 Lee and, and then the British version the M3 Grant. Um, but it is still an impressive tank and it is a monster. The standing in front of it, like it is, it's so tall. Um, and this one's also got rivets that hold all the different plates together, and uh, the rivets were an interesting uh, artifact through through that fighting in the war, where eventually they decided to start welding them all together. Uh, and the M3 Lee and the M3 Grant were great examples of why you shouldn't rivet them. It's because if you get hit right, it just turns into more bullets on the inside of the tank. Um, so they started welding them after the M3 Lee. Yeah. Side. But what it did provide was uh, the, the, the the main chassis for the hull for the M4 and then you know, all the M4 variants. So it, it was a requirement going into the war to kind of design what we know as the Sherman. And then I've also got, because it doesn't stop there, Kyle, some German armor. Yeah some German armor. I've got here uh, the King Tiger uh, variant B uh, with the Henschel turret. This is um, basically a flat front to the turret here. Uh, after a while, I believe they had a Porsche turret, um, which was slightly rounded at the front because a lot of people found out through a lot through uh, German tanks that um, you'd have like a, a, a shell trap at the front, which if it, got, it gets guided into where the turret ring is, just completely renders your 400 million ton tank completely useless, which is what happened to um, Tiger 131 at Bovington. It's got a little hole in the turret ring and it was just immobilized. So some people say that was a very lucky shot. Others are saying that that was a very precise shot from a, from a, an anti-tank crew who knew exactly what they were doing. I'm like, yeah, you're right. So I've got <laughs> that one. Yeah. And I've also got, this is where it gets really fun. I've got a Jagd Tiger, which is a hunting tiger. It was called the Jagd Tiger. So this is um, the Tiger II chassis. Uh, they took the turret off the top, which is often referred to as the casemate. Uh, they made it a fixed hull and then they chucked an even bigger gun inside it. Uh, it is absolutely monstrous. It is the size of a house. Um, my bed is as wide as one of its tracks. Uh, they have one of these at Bovington Tank Museum as well. It was an incredible thing to stand in front of. It has to be in a special part of the museum just because they can't fit it anywhere else. It's enormous. Um, and it wasn't the largest tank that they had. It had the largest gun that they had. Uh, there were a few of them, 18 I believe, that had like a massive, uh, I call it a dustbin launcher. Um, but you could literally climb down inside of it. Probably me and you could hold hands and climb down inside the barrel. It's that big. It's enormous. Uh, but I don't have that one. I've got the standard Yag Tiger, uh, which is going to be... That is going to be a big model. I'm really looking forward to getting that one out. And then, lastly, I have... Hold your horses. The mouse, or the moors, as some people refer it to. Um, it's German for mouse. This is getting into the realms of silly behaviour. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to tank design, um, the Germans basically just thought, well, I didn't think that they put it into practice, that bigger is just better all the time. Give me something bigger that, and this is the arms race, isn't it? These guys are making this tank, it has this cannon on it, it can penetrate this amount of armor, let's make something bigger, so on and so forth. And it escalates and it got a little bit out of control because this isn't the biggest. So it goes into the elephant, which I think there was only ever one, maybe even a prototype made. Uh, there were a few, uh, mouse or morse, morses, mice, whatever, uh, that did make it into the war, but right at the end it was too little too late. Some um, archaeologists would probably, or historians would say, uh, too much too late. Um, but yeah, that is going to be a beast of a model. You can see it on the back there, just look at the size of that thing. Uh, and then there were lots of experimental designs and things that the Germans wanted to bring in, um, but they were just, they were very, very fancy. It was just kind of getting a little bit out of control, but some amazing pieces of armor, which will make some, for some very interesting games. Take, a, you know, four or five Shermans up against, um, you know, Jag Tiger, what, you know, who, who does what. It'll be interesting to see. So, those models were given to me by Jeff Lacey, who you can talk to in the chat if you want to, because he is live watching right now. Uh, and Kyle's tank also came from him as well. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I love tanks. I love putting them together. And I really, really do enjoy 15mm. Um, I never thought I would before I started it, but they're absolutely cracking. So thanks very much. Uh, Adrian's put in there, the KV-1 is a heavy tank uh, and made its debut at the same time as the T-34, much to the Germans' distress. Yeah, I'm not surprised uh, because they didn't want to go to war with the Soviet Union because they were their ally to start with. So, without further ado, I'm going to crack on with this one.
Nice. What, uh, what is it? What's the one you're starting with, sorry? This is a Matilda, the Matilda infantry yes. tank. Uh, the Matilda 2, uh, it's also the Mark II A12, is its proper designation, because before it came the Mark I Matilda, which was the A11, um, but it went out of fashion so quickly that this one just became, ref you know, re this one was, was referred to as Matilda. Um, once this one was in circulation, there was no need to have the other one being referred to, whatever, so it was just called Matilda. And it's a really nice tank. Someone asked me earlier on, uh, can it move things with the power of its mind? Maybe. Who knows? Um, if you were to Google this one and go have a look at Google Images or on Wikipedia, there are a lot of um, images of this one being used in North Africa because it was quite early war. Uh, well, very early wars, right from the beginning. Uh, it didn't do so well out there, but it is um, preeminently displayed a, a lot of the times in North African uh, camouflage. I was going to have a go at it. I don't have all the colours for it, and I'm, I don't know how confident I am about it yet. So I'm just going to paint this up in British colours to match my Firefly, uh, which is right here. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to make him standard British green. But this book here that I've got is called The Tank Spotter's Guide. As you can see on the front cover here, I picked this one up when I went to the tank museum. It was at the it was at the tick, at, 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 at the checkouts, and I thought, you know, impulse buy. As I said before, I, I can't help myself sometimes, um, and it's just full of great information, and it's got almost every tank I could think of without going crazy. Um, but right here, page 24, the Matilda infantry tank, and I just had a little look to see what um, camouflages etc. I had to see if I could show you. Uh, and here we go. Here's uh, the Matilda, the A12. Uh, it's a really nice tank and it's, it's, they're all drawn but they're really good clear examples of camouflage and it gives you some really uh, interesting information in a nutshell it doesn't wrangle on about it and it kind of gives you a little bit of uh, you know, uh, information on, on the other page there turn the page and here we go to the North African colors so the I think this is called um, uh, North African Dazzle or Desert Dazzle uh, the idea is that in in the desert conditions be it around sand bright daylight etc if you have a, a dark green tank, it's going to stand out like a sore thumb. So they started experimenting with colours of sand colours and sky blue colours and even some dark greys in there as well. Um, so that if it was to crest a hill, that it would still have its outline broken up with colours that weren't going to stand out against the bright blue of the African desert. And then obviously you've got like the sand colours in there as well. It's a fairly obvious um, colour scheme. Like what, why is it painted like that? You can see why. I don't know how the darker colours work on the sides, on the kind of flanks up there. Um, but I think it actually had quite a lot of success. I was going to do it. I was going to mask it all off and just spray it all up. But I don't have these colours. And I would like something to kind of match with my Firefly. Um, so, yeah, that's what I'm going to go with today. And for that, I am going to use, Kyle, my ammo paint set, smart set, the British 1939-45, uh, which just covers all the British um, greens throughout the Second World War. Um, and it's a modulation set, uh, which means that you can do a high lighting, you can do zenith or, you know, uh, lighting, which is like you know, where the sunlight's kind of directed from. You could do object source yeah. lighting with it. Um, it's not a realistic way of painting your tanks, but it just adds a lot of flair to them and a lot of um, competition, see a lot of modulation. So one of our viewers, uh, who has his own YouTube channel, um, LJP, I think it is, um, Models, uh, does a lot of very, very high quality 135th, 124th models, etc., whatever he likes the look of, um, and he does them up very, very realistically. So he'll even paint the undercoat in swirls to kind of give you natural undercoating um, appearances, and then paint greys over the top of them, and it just kind of looks really, really nice. Modulation is almost cheat mode I suppose to kind of give you false lighting highlights and shadows uh, and I choose to use it because I, I, I really like it. it it works for me um, yeah and I just like I like to play with colors I like to experiment with them so that's what I'm gonna do now I do have here a piece of paper because I don't want to be spraying on my mat wonderful here we go it's funny you should say as well talking about the Matilda 2 I didn't study too much of World War 2 it wasn't really in my sort of specialty was it not uh, when I was doing it, but I did cover a bit of the desert campaign. That was the thing I found most interesting. North uh, Africa. War. Yeah, so I covered a bit of uh, the North Africa campaign, uh, mainly the takeover from Orkanlek to uh, Montgomery, and just opinions on on that character. Interesting. Uh, and, and how the end of that sort of conflict came about. That there, campaign sort of closed. There are a lot down. of people saying that um, that Monty was uh, a little bit 
of a warmonger and that he was doing things just to kind of experiment and see how things went and yeah wasn't really interested necessarily firsthand about winning the war or whatever um it, yeah it gets a little bit deep in, in those discussions sometimes um, so i i my final essay <laughs> in that module was about montgomery and uh, i wasn't a fan i give me yeah. his he was the first person to use the press in warfare he was, was he? the first person to do that and that went really well you saw him wearing the australian hats and wearing cat badges from all the regiments under it, underneath him and things like that and that that motivation and starting to use the press really well but um yeah he he also was very good at not passing on praise that the battle plan for el alamein 2 was Orkenlex and uh he still almost bungled it against the german forces that didn't have enough really to move all their tanks at the same time <laughs> um but it's also a completely different natured force. Uh, when you, whenever you look at the, the Allied forces and the German forces, they are very different makeup, very different initiative and command structures. So that yeah, it's a very different, always going to be a different style of fighting. Right. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other thing, we uh, my kind of one discussion point is the switch, obviously, because tanks went from being predominantly rifled, barreled, um, so they were guns to being smoothbore and the majority of modern tanks now are smoothbore so they don't have rifling in them that's really interesting why is that uh, there's a couple of reasons i believe but the smoothbore allows thinned ammunition a lot easier right and it allows the firing of uh, heat style ammunition as well a lot easier and then you'll see a lot less wear and tear on the barrel uh, by it being smoothbore and with the advent of better munitions, they just didn't need them to be rifled. Um, I believe the British tank, the Challenger, don't quote me, but maybe I think that still is rifled. There was an interesting Pretty document sure. that was floating around the other day, and I know this is going to make you cross, Kyle. Um, but the <laughs> British, <laughs> the British forces have just announced uh, their plan to revive uh, our existing armour. Um, and they're actually going to be discontinuing the Challenger 2 and they're going to be introducing a new main battle tank. I don't know how that makes you feel, but... <laughs> <laughs> I see I see when I, when I see the specs of it and uh, yeah. who... The interesting one is always... Clearly they the haven't, they haven't read which... your uh, dissertation, have they? And I, I can't believe they've missed that essay, really. It, it you know, should be in the public light. It's a masterpiece <laughs> of last minute essay writing um i, I can't believe they've ignored it but <laughs> because... always, i always find it's always telling number one under which government it's coming in under so then you have to worry about who the manufacturer is going to be is it going to be lining pockets of certain people that yeah. was a something that happened when the lynx came in the helicopter was that yeah so i don't know anything lot... about aircraft really it's more it's more of my specialty actually is aircraft um but the lynx is a fantastic machine but it's not very versatile or something like the Black Hawk fill so many roles, but um, the contract went out because it was a friend of someone in government. Um, so we ended up with the Lynx, and then we had to bring in the Merlin. We didn't have to bring in the Merlin, but we obviously got the Merlin in now, which has got a bit more of a utility role uh, and a higher lift capacity and things like that. But it'll be interesting the decision to renew it and then the current government that's in and see who the contracts are going out to. I know we're getting off modeling a little bit there but it's interesting no it's interesting see. i mean because yeah. if we have an interest in the things that we're actually making and painting and whatever it leads you into understanding what it's all about like i say I, I don't know an awful lot about aircraft um i certainly have my favorites especially from the second world war period which i'm quite a fan of knowing stuff about um and i i know a lot of people who work with aircraft who work in the army worked in the army but i don't really discuss stuff about it because when you spend as much time as they do in the army, the last thing they want to do is spend their time out of the army talking about it. So I never really got into those conversations with my friends who worked with it. But yeah, um... I've got um, I've got a kit that is going to be one of the other things I hope to move on. And I know we said it at the beginning. I've got um, what have I got? I know I've got a Spitfire, the Eurofighter, and maybe a Tiger Moth um, aircraft. Fun. Day, uh, yeah, uh, I do. I do know about the Tiger Moth. Yeah, it's a nice yes. little, nice little aircraft. The first plane I ever flew. Was it? It was a Tiger Moth. I must have been about twelve or thirteen. Just got very lucky and got to take a flight and do some flying in a Tiger Moth. Was that and through I, Air Cadets or anything that else? That was through Scouts. 
uh, before I moved to the FTX, uh, actually. But yeah, just got super lucky, super nervous because I went to get, get into it, and the guy went, "Oh no, 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 don't step there. That's that's just wooden canvas." And I was like, "Okay." Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> and then you're sat on the runway, and you can't see in front of you. <laughs> you don't know what's in front of you when you're in that thing. Um, same with <laughs> that's coming terrifying. Into yeah, it's, it's not the ideal flying situation, but no, it was absolutely phenomenal. That's brilliant. I've never, I've, I've very rarely flown. I've only ever flown a couple of times on on a couple of occasions when I've been on holiday. I've never been near the controls of an aircraft that could even fly. Um, yeah, don't, I don't know an awful lot. Um, I know a little bit about some Second World War planes. Uh, obviously, we have the Spitfire, which is very famous for its role. Uh, but I'm always been a fan of the Hawker's Hurricane. Yeah, I, yeah, I just, I think it's an amazing aircraft. I think that it's. Um, ability to do what it did was kind of overshadowed a little bit by the performance the of yeah, yeah. Uh, it was overshadowed a little bit by the by the spitfire which is fine because the spitfire definitely deserves its limelight i just think it's a really nice aircraft i think it's lovely um it couldn't do the altitude or the top end that the spitfire could do it was a suit you know that that that's why you have that difference though, yeah, yeah yeah um but it was used as a as a rocket carrying um aircraft as well so it was anti-tank for a lot of it as well especially later into the war yeah, they've got sort of the Kitty Hawk as well. Yeah. A, bit of, sort of a similar role. And the, the story that all, I always remember about the Spitfire, it must have been a good four or five marks in. I'll, I'll, I'll have a look in a second. But they realise how important it is to fuel inject aircraft when you're going to be pulling negative G. Or you stall the engine out. Because yeah, so you're the, pushing all the fuel out of the pipes. Yeah. Yeah. You, or you close the... You close up the carburetor uh, against the... Where, where the fuel's going in, there's like a float. And the negative G's basically pushes that into the engine. So the fuel can't get in. And the Messerschmitt pilots worked that out early and were trying to get Spitfire pilots to follow them into dives uh, to, to pull negative Gs uh, and stop wow. their aircraft. So they realised they had to fuel inject. There's a lot of the Messerschmitt were always fuel injected. There's a lot of science and theory that goes oh, into it's flying, crazy. isn't there? It's crazy. I mean, I suppose there isn't any kind of theatre of war, but yeah, mental. So what I'm doing here, Kyle, with this Matilda is I've got the four colours. I've got basically shadow, and, uh, which is this dark brown that I'm using now, olive drab, which is the, the main bulk of this colour. And then I go into, um, it's called service drab, which is basically a highlight version. And then there's an almost whitey version of it as well. So I'm just kind of going in all the areas where um, I'm faking shadow. So down the sides, you can't see it now because I've, I've completely covered it over. But down the sides <laughs> of the Matilda are basically vents that, um, that allow um debris to come out of the protective side skirts from the tracks uh, and i'm just kind of forcing shadow into there i'm doing the underside pretty much entirely in this color uh, and all the bogies which is all the wheel systems underneath i also like to use this as a bit of a base color for tracks as well tracks is an interesting thing when it when it comes to doing your tracks on your tank you're you're going to encounter the same issue is what color are tracks well, they were never painted because they all got worn down. So the bits that were exposed and touching ground regularly were always um, basically polished steel. So anything that's kind of a dark metal colour um, that would shine bright against all the rest of the colours is fine. But if you're doing mud or you're doing dust and things like that, it would gather. So there is a there's a recipe that you kind of need to work out as you know f for yourself. I think every miniature painter has their own way of doing tank tracks. And I've yet to work out what mine really is. Occasionally you can see me spraying off the side because I'm just making sure that my airbrush is flowing. So I've got these little patches over here and I just had a big blob just go right there. That's because it's drying slightly on the needle of my airbrush. Um, and I just every now and again just need to make sure that I'm wiping that down. And it did just splodge ever so slightly on the front of that tank just there. So I'm just gonna put a bit of air on that. Spread that out. Always make sure that your airbrush is flowing smooth. I do have thinner in there, and I also have um, flow improver, which I might put an extra drop of that in. I cleaned it all out before we went live today. It was being a little bit temperamental with me. That's because I learned to use this airbrush and all the mistakes I've learned with it. Um, so I probably the inside of this airbrush on the in here is probably not ideal it's not not broken but it's probably not as smooth as it needs to be so uh, i'm basically now all the bits that are kind of 
underneath. So at the back, I've got this overhang here. I'm spraying the shadow into there. And then later, I'll do lighter colors from the other direction. And that will be like zenithal lighting, fake shadows, basically. Um, and I can do like natural blending from one color to another. I'm going to hit the whole bottom of this tank with this dark brown. And then I'll make a couple of passes with a lighter olive drab just to kind of uh, blend the shadow a bit more over to the sides of the tracks. But we're very rarely going to see underneath here. This is just a peace of mind and practice, really. Yeah, I always think that with some of my, some of my models as well. It's nice to do it for the practice. But it's also, yeah. the insides of Rhinos and things like that. It's there for because you want it to be done properly and uh, it's a good practice. There's, there's no point in any of the games that I've played with these 15mm tanks where you flip them upside down. Or there, there isn't, it just doesn't do that. But, you know, peace of mind. Your model, put put your pride into it, right? Of course, if you don't want to, your model. Do as you will. Um, just had a couple of comments. Um, Jeff said about the uh, American, uh, sort of the late warbirds. And again, they were fantastic. And you talk about the Spitfire, the Hurricane. You've got to mention the P-51 Mustang. Yeah, of course you do. Cadillac in the sky. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic bit of kit. Was slightly out of by the Spitfire, but well, at least the best mark in the Spitfire, the Mark 14. Um, was it really? Yeah, I thought so that the, I thought that the Mustang outperformed the Spitfire ever so slightly. No, so the Spitfire was slightly faster and had uh, a faster climb rate, which was really important for obviously interceptor. But where the difference is, is the the Mustang had a slightly different role. It was a great um, sort of escort craft. It, it was absolutely phenomenal at that. Um, okay. It had better visibility and just a bit more versatility as well. So it's kind of like as an interceptor, the Spitfire. Spitfire was the better aircraft, but when you're obviously escorting, you don't, you don't, you can be that little bit slower. We're only talking, maybe I think it was maybe eight, ten, eight to ten mile per hour slower. But every uh, every digit speed. counts, right? Yeah, especially when you're on intercept. You know, you've got to get there. Um, Battle of Britain. Spitfire could climb better, climb slightly faster. That's really interesting. But again, oh, just I didn't, I didn't know. I, I genuinely thought that the Mustang was was better at doing its things than the Spitfire was. Um, I know that the Mustang, sorry, the um, the Messerschmitt uh, could outclimb the Spitfire quite easily. Um, and then it just come down to who was the better pilot, really. Um, yeah, but I say, I, I don't know an awful lot about aircraft. I do, with the the iconic aircraft, the ones that we're talking about, Spitfire, Hurricane, Messerschmitt, etc., etc., uh, even the Stuka, I know a bit about those because they're so prolific in history and culture and, you know, education. But beyond that, it's, it's a little bit, I just, you know, resort to video games, really, for my knowledge. Um, yeah, bit, I feel a bit um, amateurish, I suppose. Um... Except this is a, a real crossover in things that I enjoy now. There's um, so the the, Ger the German dive bombers because they go so quickly, they lost so much altitude so quickly. There was a huge pressure change, so right. the pilots had to learn how to equalise really efficiently and really quickly. And obviously, when you're flying a plane, you can't put your hand on your nose. Um, you can't. You don't have a constant supply of oxygen like you do in a scuba diver. And they came up with a frenzel technique, which is what you use in free diving to equalise. It's because it's much, much more efficient. Um, and it's you use your tongue to close off basically your head cavity, and you just use all the air that you have in your wow. head cavity, so you're not using anything from your lungs. And these are techniques that they were employing during that time. Yeah, they came up with it during that time. Um, That's really quite been, interesting. Yeah, it's been taken from the, the dive bombers to free divers because it's a much better, much more efficient equalization method. Just as a little, little fun fact. Little, little fun because fact. if any of you don't know Kyle, uh, you'll know that he's actually a pro swimmer uh, and you're really into free diving. Definitely not a pro. I got, I got <laughs> beaten too much at being to be a pro swimmer. Cool. So. Where am I at right now? Uh, I'm going a little bit over the top. It might look with a lot of the shadow here, but all I'm doing is because there's a lot of raised details on the back. I don't actually know what they all are. I don't know very much about this tank, um, but I want to between these little bumps, almost like a corrugated tin roof, I suppose. I just wanted to get a little bit of shadow in there. So later I'll hit it sideways with the olive drab and that should uh, leave a little bit of um, the, the, sh the fake shadow between those those lines if you will um and then i've done a little bit on the front here so i will leave a little bit in the in the kind of corner in the creases in there and that should provide me with a little bit of fake shadow 
I've now got this teeny tiny turret, which I'm fairly certain earlier on I said was a 37mm cannon. That's an absolute lie. I think that <laughs> that is the coax that is beside it, um, but that is uh, the quickfire two-pounder, um, which is still quite a shell to be firing at infantry and small buildings and things like that, but it's just, it's just nothing uh, compared to what you are required to take out large armour. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely not a little 37. Quickfire two-pounder. I will now... I'm going to do a little bit, I'm going to turn the pressure down on my airbrush. It's coming out a little bit too hard. If I'm, if I'm going too gentle with it, it's spattering everywhere. Um, because it, yeah, that's what it wants to do. So you're trying to stop it spattering, you put a bit more airflow through it. But there's far too much air being pumped through it from the pressure. That it just kind of drowns everything. So it does small things like this. Just turn the pressure down a little bit. That's a, a tip that I've learned the hard way. It could be wrong. <laughs> oh, you know what? I forgot to ask, Danny. Go on. What, what's everyone painting tonight? Hey, there it is. There I it was is. wondering. Last week I got berated <laughs> for it. <laughs> berated's a strong word. He's fired. <laughs> <laughs> You're fired. Sir. Who's painting? Is anyone painting anything different in homage to us switching over the tanks tonight? Are you just cracking on with your projects? Let us know. Always nice to see what people are up to. Also, hit us up with some photos as well. Get it on the Facebook page. I want to get my 10 man assault intercessor squad finally fully painted and finished so I can get some pictures up. Um, and I'd like them with my suppressors I've got because that's the start of my little crusade course. Well, this takes us uh, quite neatly and a little segue to one of the things that we wanted to talk about today, isn't it? Which is um, I played 40k. 9th edition for the first time the other day played two games played very small games which is how i like to play it anyway um, i don't mind playing the bigger games um but in recent not recent editions so much but in previous editions it certainly paved the way to be a much larger war game scale game i like the skirmish side of it so me and my opponent my housemate uh, we made 25 powerpoint games no, sorry, uh, armies, and off we went. And the first game was about 45 minutes of me being taken apart piecemeal with very little effort to be able to do anything about it. Uh, that was very demoralizing, and I knew it was an exceptional um, uh, diversion from what it normally would be, um, but it was still very upsetting. So I was like, right, well, I've learned my lesson. What I took was a unit that was very, very heavy, very hard hitting. Um, but was a point sink really. I took in my three zone tropes that I was painting over the last couple of weeks um, And they don't do anything because you've got loads of them in there It's just more wounds essentially because the more things you have they, they could do one thing go around and zap stuff or they can kind of command other things to do stuff um, But having more in there is just it just takes longer to get rid of them So you can just ignore them and fly around and do other things which is exactly what my opponent did um, so I was like, hey, I'm going to have a little rethink about my force. Um, do you fancy a second game? He's like, yep, yeah, sure, cool. So I took those guys out of it and I just uh, in I doubled the amount of small runny things that I had with claws and guns um, and stuck a few other floaty brain mines in there. And it was very, very close. And I have to hand it to my opponent. Uh, for a while there, we thought that um, he had one. It turned out that actually it was a draw and i was like yeah and then it turned out actually we've got a unit that he had surviving on the table that was hiding and it made him win clear <laughs> uh, but the, the game was very very tactical we really enjoyed it with a, a cracking fun uh, because it was a small game we played it on a half size table so we played on uh, essentially three by four which is it means that you get right into the meat and potatoes of the game very early uh, which is as a tyranids player close combat specialist that uh, appeases me brilliantly because it's not an extra turn or two of having to run towards the enemy while they shoot you and then diminish your you know your units down. Um, I, I saw some excellent rolling from my side. I saw some appalling rolling from my opponent. But, Just how you um, want it. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Um, and like you had speculated, the um, the loss of um, being able to use. <sighs> overwatch every turn every every time um, was ma a massive game changer and i could see why they did it uh yeah and it, it allowed me to think about how i was going to organize my attacks and forcing my opponent to choose which one he had to overwatch on going okay well this sucks to be you because by the time you, you i'm gonna do this unit 
or you're going to miss out because I'm already going to be in close combat and you can't overwatch in that situation. Yeah, it was, it was very, very interesting. I played Tyranids against the Eldar, um, and my Eldar opponent definitely deserved the victory, um, but I made it harder for him in the, in, the, in the second game. The first one, I just basically, I might as well just gone and stood in the kitchen and, and made some food for a while. <laughs> it was terrible, it really was. But I had a really, really good time. Um, and what was brilliant about it is in the space it would have taken me to play um, one game, in previous editions in, in large scale games is that it i played two and i could probably have played the third in that same time frame um and i still had as much fun i do I like really i do enjoy. like do like i do like to play the bigger games sometimes but those small games are just where it's at you know and a cracking I really enjoy time. a small game there's just, just something about it because you know as well with your force you just can't you can't cover every base so you yeah. have to start making sacrifices you have to start trying to play to your strengths that's exactly to mitigate it. your weaknesses i really enjoy it and we had a couple of comments come in as well Go luke on. is painting sisters of battle as always adrian has finally finished all of his praetorians they are finally yeah. getting after 22 Pre years <laughs> it, what that's i would like to know what i would like to know is is that do you think a result of this show has this show provided you with the motivation the encouragement enthusiasm maybe the inspiration to kind of get that done if it has i'll, I'll be beside myself with joy <laughs> no pressure um <laughs> and where are we? Darren's just said hi. Hi, oh, Darren. Hi, Darren. Nice again. to see you again. Yeah. Fantastic. Regular viewers. And, oh, Luke. <laughs> Thank you. Luke sent me some scatter, and uh, anybody that knows me knows me how terrible I am with my phone. Thank you. That got here today. I completely forgot to message you to say it's here. <laughs> um, I meant to actually bring it up with me. I'll bring it up after, uh, after the break so I can crack open the box and have a look. Kyle uh, is uh, terrible with his phone. Um, <laughs> try, trying to get in contact with him to prepare for a show is tough uh, which is one of those things that we have to get on with yep. <laughs> um, but I have also been keeping up with the uh, stuff that's going on uh, Facebook and Luke the other day put up a photo of all the different scatters that he's been making he made a massive bulk of it it's been a whole day different colours for different things whatever really interesting go and have a little look if you haven't seen it already um, I saw Adrian had also finished the Fortress of Redemption he said last week he's put photos of that up that's really cool um, Kess or Kesslin uh, who I don't think is actually online with us today uh, I think that she normally works put a photo up of uh, Battletech Force uh, with her greys and yellows I think I mentioned it last week but it's worth bringing up again because they look really cool um, so well done on that nice to see some units finally being done there I know that Kesslin said to me uh, in a private chat was basically saying that he hasn't had the motivation to play or paint for years um, and actually had some 40k stuff a little while ago and started to really enjoy this show so much asked her friend for all those old models back again so it's really nice to know that you know here we are yeah are we what's Adri said there I expect two of you to pop up next to each other to catch up someone called Joy oh okay cool <laughs> <laughs> we should I, I wish just popped up with the banner like you did it you finished <laughs> yeah yeah if I knew what I was doing as a broadcaster <laughs> I could have lots of little animations to say well done you <laughs> where are we what time are we at we're, we're about a cut well, about five minutes away or so from uh, moving into our into our break maybe about ten minutes um, but I'm gonna crack on anyway because I'm, I'm getting stuff done here and um, I was oh. gonna... Some, some views just whilst you're sort of cracking on then uh, a game that you you ran you run good map, map run. um just talking to myself makes great tv doesn't it um <laughs> the uh was it werewolf the masquerade yeah yeah Darkness. yeah that Anybody... game came out the computer game came out yes yesterday i think it was was it that was um, that right recent yeah, yeah i think it was literally yesterday maybe day before um and i'm just really intrigued and excited to see if they've done the roleplay game justice because it was uh, a phenomenal roleplay game to play um, the whole world setting all of it just absolutely love it so hopefully they get that tone right anybody who knows kyle cool. and myself will know that we play lots of different games from board games tabletop games roleplay games anything where you get a little bit of escapism and a little bit of adventure into it and i always thought with the world of darkness there's a real tone and flavor so that's that's what I hope they get right the most in the game. Um, yes. That game. Um, and from what I've seen, it, they... it did look really good. Yeah. Did look really promising. good. Uh, they've also, of course, done the vampire one as well. 
Have they made the vamp? Yeah, uh, I don't know if it was released. I think it was released a little while ago, or it was getting close to release. And it might have been close to the time of the pandemic kind of broke out. So, uh, yeah, I obviously I, I lost touch with that, especially as um, when the pandemic came around, I started creating this show. So a lot of my time and effort went into this, really. In the first um, pandemic, we actually played the vampire one, didn't we, online. Yes, uh, we did. Game. Yeah, right back yeah. at the beginning of our first UK lockdown, we were playing games online a lot, which kind of um, led me into thinking I could do this show and maybe we can even play games and stuff on, on online as a part of it. Yeah. It's important to mention, obviously, video games and board games as well, because they all tie into... Um, well, they all affect each other, don't they? So, yeah, definitely. Like, I play a lot of games or video games that are World War II related, um, you know, and there's obviously thing, you know, the sh shooter games that are the same sort of thing as well. And they, they all kind of help you understand I learn a lot. Maybe that's just because I'm, I mean, you know, I'm a bit older than a, a lot of um, people who play Xbox and you know, Call of Duty or whatever. But I, you know, as I'm playing, I play War Thunder, uh, which is a free game. You should definitely go and do it. And there's so much energy and passion from the creators of that game that have gone into making everything accurate. Uh, I learned a lot from it. And sometimes you think, oh, I wonder if they did get it right. And then I went off and did research. And that's a valuable thing in itself. Me wanting to go off and research because of a game you know, and I learned stuff and realised actually, you know, these guys really do know what they're talking about. Um, they put the effort in. Yeah, they really have done. Uh, and it's, you know, it's fascinating. Okay, so now I'm moving on to my olive drab. This is a really nice colour. I really like working with greens. Greens are smooth and creamy, and you get some wonderful colours of it. Um, and this one, if I spray on here, oh, beautiful. <laughs> it's kind of super Mellow. smooth. Sorry, Mellow Brooks, I said my computer games are completely painted, at least. Yeah, yeah, same. <laughs> yeah. They are, at least. To, to be honest, I'm as bad with computer games and finishing them as I am with finishing painting my models, So The amount of starts I do on strategy games or something, because I think of a new idea that I want to play. Um, we play a lot of sort of Stellaris recently, where you get to make your own alien race, and it can be absolutely anything you can think of in your imagination. I get about halfway through these very long games and go, I've got a great new idea. I'm going to play a devouring <laughs> yeah. robot swarm. That's what I need to do right now. Um, this so, is how I need to spend my life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's what that's what I like about things like that. Those creativity. That's what really draws me into it. Is, is, is this is a little bit of a, a look into your mind's eye, isn't it? It's making models or creating something. It's what's going on inside up there. And uh, yeah, yeah, any, any kind of game that allows me to make something, I'll, I'll, I'll make it, I'll be happy, I'll play it. Ten minutes into it, I'm like, I've come up with a better idea. I'll, yeah, leave, this, I'll leave this game to the side and I'll carry on <laughs> and I'll play this one over here. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big culprit with that one, definitely. It's <laughs> brilliant. It's okay. why I think I've started the majority of armies in uh, Warhammer 40,000. I've had uh, a couple of units of at least most of them because I go, oh, I've got a great idea for them an army of that race I'll well we start. we've spoke about this recently as well haven't we <laughs> yeah yeah yes, <laughs> but i'm doing well i'm back on blood angels which is the original uh, and i'm committed i mean I'm, um, I'm, I'm so looking forward to actually being able to play you and i think what we're a week or two away from potentially being able to see friends and stuff we'll see we'll i know see. I know. On that note as well, before we go to um, our interval, I'll just I'll take us over to our waiting for our interval page. Um, there is some news that's popping up, and I'm not going to go into too much detail at the moment because I don't know the validity of it, and I am going to do my homework and hopefully come up with some information next week, is that we are looking, because we're having a bit of a positive response with the whole lockdown in the UK here, that there might actually be... Uh, the prospect of being able to go to a convention later in the year, it's a war games convention, not like a Comic Con convention or anything like that. Um, and it's one of the bigger ones. Um, I don't know where the information's come from. I've heard it on the grapevine. I'm not going to give anything away yet. It's a maybe. And if it does, it'll be really nice to kind of go and make an appearance uh, as Easy 8. So, Kyle, if, if that's, I think it'll be sort of November time. So, if that's something that we can do, it'll be really nice to go and represent um, and maybe offer it out to our community and just say, like, hey, it's been a tough year. It's been a tough couple of years by that point. Let's go and, you know, meet up, uh, represent the community and, and go and see what you know, some of these conventions are all about. And if more open up, then obviously we'll talk about those as well. But that that'll be that's something really worth knowing, I think, because yeah. all the big ones got cancelled this year. Well, all of them got cancelled, obviously. Yeah, I know a couple went on. 
uh, a couple of the tournaments went on online, didn't they? They did them using yeah. the tabletop simulator, which is nice to at least see the heap up with the times and, and getting that going. Adrian as well has just said, my problem with strategy games, uh, I play is less the changing of mind, but the computer crashing, which is, I feel your pain there for a long time. We, uh, we all know about computers struggling. Yeah. <laughs> Don't go back and watch episode 11. <laughs> Whatever you do. Yeah. Oh, dear. Oh. But last week was a great save from that episode. And this week just feels a little bit more chilled out. I feel I feel we're at the place where we need to be right now. Well, it is really nice having a change. Um, uh, just a, a new topic to talk about. Talking about tanks, World War II in general. Yeah. Uh, just as something a little bit different for you guys whilst you're painting and, and hobbying having a little chat and like I say this is a whole new scale this it almost feels like a whole new skill there's a whole new set of modeling going down uh, just going down in scale rather than painting the huge new space marines uh, well the thing the thing with these little tanks is though I really like to do all my um, World War two stuff justice is that less is more because they're so tiny you're just gonna lose everything on them um, so just take your time, have some fun painting them, and, and don't take it too seriously. There are people I've seen, like some pros on YouTube, that um, have gone in full depth on it, and they do look astonishing. But when I've got so many other things waiting on the side, just you know, take take your time, you know, have some fun with it, and uh, yeah, don't 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 go too far with it unless you so you want to. The idea is it's it's a great way to break up the pace of everything else that you've got. And again, when the um, when when the lockdown's over and we are allowed to um, to see each other, uh, I do have some more Soviet tanks here. Obviously, the ones that you've seen here today, uh, but also my housemate's got a couple. Um, and you come on over and play a couple of those uh, 15 yeah. millimeter games. And then, obviously, once we're once we're done with that, we can talk about that on the show. It'd be really nice. Yeah. Maybe even get a few pictures for the uh, absolutely for the Facebook group. Absolutely. Uh, Adrian said as well, if we do a convention, we should get T-shirts made up, which is hilarious because. We've definitely already talked about that because I absolutely love like a already <laughs> like a several yeah. steps ahead of you there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at actually making some merchandise. Uh, what I would really like before I start spending lots of money or time into making merch for this community is for the community just to simply grow a little bit. But that's not to say that I can't do limited runs or just start, um, you know, opening up into that realm slightly. Obviously, what I would like to do is be able to put the money that is made on merchandise into the into this show and everything that I do with it and all the other things that I've got lined up waiting to go um, but that obviously means I've got to turn this into a business because I have to declare that it's income even if it's donations and things like that uh, and that obviously is, is its own area of concern and it, it creates headaches as well it is something that is literally right on the border of, of kicking off easy eight will hopefully become a business we've done so well um, so yeah who knows? It 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 will, it will be nice to have all that merchandise and represent. Yes, it is coming. Hold on tight, basically. Um, but with that in mind, uh, we'll be back in about 10 minutes or so uh, while we have this little jazzy intermission. So if you need to go and change your paint water, you should go and change your paint water. If you need to go to the bathroom or stretch your legs or whatever, now's the time to do it. And we will see you back here in just a few minutes.
and we're back! Yeah, cool. I didn't go anywhere. Kyle did. Uh, I realised that I missed some big open spots <laughs> that were just <laughs> still o undercoat showing through. Um, so I missed my opportunity to go and get a glass of wine, uh, which I like to do in the second half of the show. But uh, yeah, I I've spotted where I've missed it. Underneath the bogeys was quite obvious when I looked. So yeah, I've been working hard on trying to cover that up. Uh, but the paint's still quite tacky on this thing at the moment. So I just thought I would... Um, just cover up that last little bit on there and leave it to dry while we talk about some other bits and pieces. Let's just get that sorted out. There we go. Lovely. And I might come back in a minute with a dark version of that colour. So, while I purge my airbrush out, I wanted to talk about uh, my shopping list that I said I was going to hopefully bring this week. Uh, the majority of it arrived. All of the stuff that I had ordered had arrived. Um, I realised unfortunately that there was a bit that I ticked on the list that I wanted. It was quite extensive, um, uh, and I hadn't actually added it to any basket. Um, so I ordered it yesterday, and unfortunately, I was I was hoping it was going to come today for the show. It hasn't. Bit of a shame. It's really exciting stuff. I'll bring it next week, and we can talk about it. Oh, tell you a little bit about it now so anyway my list of stuff that i bought i spent a lot of money it was stuff that i felt that i absolutely needed um and some of it was stuff that i thought yeah i thought oh that's only two pounds add to cart because yeah. that's how we roll all right yeah. um but the, the two main things that i really wanted apart from airbrush cleaner which i got uh, a ton of because i go through it so quickly um it was some really decent brushes and i've been harking on about this for ages uh, is is it's time to spend some money on some brushes i even though i'm still producing stuff that i think is a little bit below the standard that i can really push to i think about that level now where buying better equipment is really going to help my progress so i spent some money on two brushes they were actually a little bit difficult to get hold of uh, but a little bit looking you can so the first one i got and i'll show you proper close up in a minute on the uh, workbench is i got a Raphael kalinsky brush this was about 16 17 pound so it's quite a bit of money it's not a massive brush uh, but it does go down to a really fine tip and that's really really important for doing detail one of the things that i've learned um, and then I watched some expert YouTubers tell me about it after I'd learned it the hard way, <laughs> great timing, is that you don't need a tiny brush to do tiny um, details. Uh, what you need is a brush that's actually quite large in the belly, which is the main bulk of the bristle head, if you like, that goes down to a fine point. And one of the best substances for that is Kalinsky Sable, uh, squirrel fur, essentially. Um, they really, really hold their fine point. Having a bigger belly on the bristles means that it, it um, holds more paint and it's basically going to flow from the brush smoother, etc. Um, there's a lot of care that goes into using a Kalinsky brush. So if you're going to buy one, make sure that you are satisfied with um, the state of care of your brushes, or at least that you know how to and will do when you buy a good one. I uh, highly recommend them. I found uh, these on Amazon. Uh, there are stockists that you can get them from uh, in other places. I got some from Amazon because it was the cheapest one going around at the time. Uh, just be aware of where they come from, especially if you're in the UK. Obviously, Brexit's caused some trade deal issues. This one is a number two. I think they go down to a zero and then they increase in number relative in size as well. This is a number two and it's probably uh, about a centimetre and a half long. And I, from all of the reviews that I watched on YouTube, it's probably one of the more preferred sizes. So I thought, right, that's the one I'm going to get. I was going to get that one and a number three. But what I decided to do is I got another sable brush, but I got this one from Army Painter. I was talking about these a little while ago. If you want to experiment into new brushes, but don't want to spend a fortune like the Raphael brush or even some Winsor & Newton brushes as well, Army Painter do their white brushes, their sable, um, and they do them in different sizes. They've all got names, and this one's called uh, the Wargamer Regiment, the Regiment brush. This is pretty much the workhorse of every pro out there. Every YouTuber that I see, every commission painter that I've, that I've um, got, you know, looked into what they do, this is in their arsenal somewhere, and this is only about five or six quid I, I can't remember exactly how much i paid for it but it's really worth going for they do um synthetic brushes as well which are like a dark red color and then they do their sable ones it's definitely worth going and have a little look at um i like to get all my stuff from just play because they're one of the um companies that i support through this channel and there's links to um, just play 
just play games uk in the description of this channel um in this video sorry but unfortunately they've sold out which tells you a lot about this brush doesn't it because they're super good um so i've got one of those as well just be like my, my general workhorse it's a bit smaller and it's not got the point on it that the raphael brush has so this is going to be my small general workhorse layering brush so those are the two things that i really really wanted to get out of it everything else is kind of goodies in the bag really so what else did i get i got some satin varnish and matte varnish for my airbrush those are also absolutely fine to apply by brush as well i also got um because i'd ran out of all my primers using my housemates quite a lot um surface primer from vallejo these are designed for the airbrush but again they can be applied by brush i got white and gray I like to use grey because it's pretty much good for almost every colour. There are some exceptions where you'd want to go to black, um, but I do a lot of uh, bright colours and green colours, etc. World War II stuff and 40k. Uh, grey is a really good mid colour to go with. I also got white because I paint yellow. <laughs> if you paint in yellow, go white. Or pink, I have re uh, uh, witnessed recently. Okay pink undercoat for your yellows and if you use inks and take your time and you have to airbrush inks um, but you will get um, some really nice blends from almost orange colors right up to um, uh, to your bright yellows going into inks of course I got myself um, some shader this is from ammo mig this is the same company that does the smart colors that I'm working with here today again it, inks are for the airbrush they are to be used with super low pressures they're super fine but super super intense um, so the idea with this one is it's going to create those um, areas of ultra definition between all the carapace plates that I was doing on Tyranids a little while ago. Do you remember I was having problems with the non oil? This is my solution to it. Uh, absolutely fantastic stuff. I got some Green Stuff World Brush Cleaner. Uh, this is uh, an option along with all the soaps that you can get out there. This is a little bit harsher than those soaps out there. So this is ones for brushes that you're trying to save. It's pretty good stuff. I had to go with it. It's really good. I will do some reviews on them, uh, especially once I've had a, a proper go with them and clean some brushes up a little bit. I don't know if it's particularly good to be using all the time on sable brushes i would be careful but on your standard synthetic brushes absolutely brilliant stuff i've got some crackle medium haven't opened it haven't had a go on it but we talked about it last week so we did a lot on crackle paints and mediums and things so i'm really excited to have a go on that one um and the stuff that kyle was really excited to have a go at to, uh, or to talk about was fluorescent paints yeah i went and bought a load of um, green stuff world fluorescence i did a lot of research into um, fluorescent paints uh, which brands did the best colors ranges etc uh, and i know that i buy a lot of my stuff from either vallejo or from especially green stuff world and i wanted to try something different but green stuff world did the best color ranges however on almost every site that i went on um everyone was sold out in the colors that i wanted that is absolutely no green in this country wherever i looked whatsoever um so i wanted to do some like acid pools but with fluorescent colors so i've got red i've got orange and i've got yellow orange and i got most of those from just play so thanks guys at just play however the yellow orange is a bit weird because i did order yellow <laughs> i was gonna say hey guys you sent me the wrong color but i thought actually it's just another step in the gradient of my blending so i'll, I'll just buy a yellow and, and i'll have all four rather than three so i'm gonna do some lava stuff with those and just have them really bright colorful um and you can apply those with airbrush or by brush or whatever and i'm really excited to have a little play of those so yeah where did i get all these things from i got them from i've got the list here because i've actually put all of the um, names of all the companies that i've got this stuff from in the description of this video you should definitely head on over and have a little look so i went to scale model shop uh, where i bought my black ink from it was about the only place where i could really find it at an affordable price scale model shop uh, .co .uk. We've got loads of stuff up there gonna have a little look Entoyment War Gaming and Hobby Center. They're a little bit like uh, Just Play, so they do lots of uh, products for war gaming and tabletop gaming, etc. But they also are a game center, so you can drop in there as well. I got uh, my regiment brush from them, and I also got the red fluorescent paint from them. Just Play Games. Uh, we all know about Just Play. We talk about them almost every week. Um, yeah, I got my yellow fluorescent paint, my orange fluorescent paint, crackle medium, satin varnish, matte varnish, and I also got my um airbrush cleaner and my primers from them so they had a massive bulk of the stock let's say they got a huge range it's always worth going to have a look at their stuff and i also got um some bits and pieces from element games that's the stuff that i missed out from last week 
um, and it's on order. I expect it probably will come tomorrow a bit late, uh, but we'll talk about it a little bit next week, or if I've got time, I'll do a little Facebook video for you guys as well, so you can have a little look. But I'm getting some UV uh, resin, and I'm also getting some splash effects gel so that I can make liquid effects on bases and, and um, the terrain and things like that. The UV resin is something that I'm really excited about because I also went to Amazon. I bought my Raphael brush, and I bought my brush cleaner, and I also bought a UV torch. It's so cool. It's basically, so it's just UV light, and it's got some you know purple light in there to make so you see where you can shine it. But basically, the resin um, just sits there. It will solidify in general sunlight, but it will take hours, maybe days. But when you've applied it to where you want it to go, you shine this little torch on it, and it's dried. It cures instantly under UV um, light. And I should imagine that's probably a byproduct of um, the printing industry or printing world, where they started experimenting and playing with UV lasers. Uh, into pools of resin to kind of get those really really cool um, detailed models so I'm really excited for all that stuff to turn up because I love playing with like liquid effects on bases and things I do all the acid stuff that's my massive shopping list it originally came to just under a hundred pounds with all delivery and everything included and then I realized I forgot my splash effects and my UV resin which took me to a considerable price tag higher because um, I bought the large part of UV resin or the middle range part but that's all green stuff world uh, green stuff world products again so splash effects from them uh, they do loads of stuff they do frost effects they do ice effects they spider web serum and you've got to have special cleaner for your airbrush for it they do loads of stuff which is why i like getting my stuff from green stuff world anyway that's my shopping list and all of those names of all those companies uh it was it was a really quite a fun experience going through going through in depth uh, everything that they had um and i've written down all of the links to all the facebook pages websites etc to all of those guys uh, i haven't contacted them like i have just play this isn't an advert for them at all it's just me saying like hey for the community it's really worth heading on over and you can just go over and, and click on those links in the description to this video Oh, yeah, that was quite a list. What do you think, Kyle? Going to get yourself a decent sable brush? Uh, I'm not there yet. Um, it's not... I, I, I have to be very tight with my hobby money at the moment. Sure. So on my list of things, it's not there yet because my ability is not there. Um, yeah, that's why I've held off till now. Angels, and with my blood angels, I'm using so much dry brushing. Um, I, I'm not going to need that detailing yet or have the practice to step up to it um it's why i am interested in in getting some other models in to paint just to try sort of honing some other techniques and things but yeah saints i'm a little bit off that definitely uh, but i'm really looking forward to and so is jeff as well about seeing some lava done yeah that's, it's, it's really why i've got it because i was talking to jeff because jeff is my dad um, and we obviously <laughs> we i know i know shock horror for those people who are just tuning in jeff is my old man um and we were just talking uh, over the last couple of weeks we share a lot of images and kind of inspirations and things that we find um just one just before we went live of the most insane collection of orcs i've ever seen in my entire life <laughs> i'll share it on facebook later on it is immense um but he was just i showed me uh, this this lava uh, base with you know, some blackened earth around it and it was incredible and it looked like and then i did my research it was all done with uh, fluorescent paints so i was like gotta have a go on that and then i was gonna see if i could also get the greens to do the acid bases like i had done i just can't find those greens anywhere so yeah that's that i'm really looking forward to doing it i might do it as a separate video um because any of my product um tutorials or you know product reviews or whatever the shtick that I think that we deliver here at Easy Eight is, is all live. So if there's a problem, you get to see it happening, and it's not re, you know re-recorded and done, and you know awkward things edited out or whatever. You get to see for your own, you know, in, in, right in front of your eyes. Yeah, it'll be fun. I'm also looking forward to playing around with that um, ink shader as well. That's going to be really interesting. Anyway, obviously, Carl, you said that you weren't able to paint your um, T34, but I know that we've actually had a couple of people, uh, a couple of our viewers. That were talking to me about it just before we went um uh, not just before we went live today but just earlier on uh that they really were looking forward to seeing the t34 and so i was wondering maybe we could get like a good close-up on it there so i'm going to bring you up on full screen so they can't see me here we go over to kyle you can see that he's on skype there <laughs> um yeah we want to get a real good close-up of it if we can it's a really nice model yeah it it's is really a fantastic mo little model it's really accurate as well, and they're really clean as well, aren't they? Really clean models, the sprues on them, etc. 
yeah, no, yeah. they really are. I was really impressed with it and the detail in it. And uh, is that also that's, I think that's a nice color green more. as well, isn't it? So you don't have to paint it if yeah. you don't want to. If you want to just play a quick game or whatever, you just go straight into it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, obviously it will be painted, but yeah. it is. Yeah, it's a great base green already there to use. So yeah, going to be going to be good. I just Excellent. yeah left it too late to yeah, yeah look yeah. into what paint to buy. So I thought, you know what? It'd be really nice with having quite a, a long stressful week to watch you paint one um and know what i'm doing and then it will be done uh, on next week's show then i, I really it. take my time when it comes to painting these little ones because i do it all airbrush i could probably have done it with you know with a decent tank brush by now but i i should enjoy playing with the airbrush i'm also practicing a lot with it playing around different colors and getting a feel for it uh so yeah it's gonna take me the whole show to get this one little matilda done um but it's not gonna be um What's the word I'm looking for? Weathered. And I was hoping that we could go into weathering maybe next week when you're probably painting up your T34 as I can prepare you for the weathering effects on it if you want to do any. And I can talk about the massive range of uh, weathering effects and products and things that are out there. It's something that, that's one of the real reasons that I like to do realistic effects on my World War II tanks. Um, it's just because there's just so much you can do. And the larger the, 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 the scale, the, the more involved you can get into it. Obviously, the smaller stuff, less is more. You don't have to go mental with it, but it's nice to do some, like, you know, panel lining and some grime or rust effects and things like that. Just mild, it makes them really stand out. Nice. I've never weathered a model or a vehicle. I had them before I started collecting cool. World War II. Um, for example, you can see, uh, if I take you over to the workbench here. Boop. Here we are. So if I take you over to the workbench, you can see my tiger um, you can see all the lines and panels and definition in the one over that's all just because i've used um weathering effects on them when it comes down to this size scale really what your weathering is doing is making them look a little bit dirtier and defining the the detail on it a bit more so you don't want to go you don't want to go too crazy the difference here between my um american sherman and the british firefly sherman um it's quite small there i haven't done any weathering on this one yet and it might be I don't know if you can really see too much. There's a lot of weathering and definition on this one and nothing on this one. Uh, and you can't see all the panels as clear on the Firefly here. Um, and that's just because of the weathering just kind of makes it stand out a bit more. So, yeah, I take it easy at this scale. I, I put a lot more into 28mm um, and I've got the 135th scale, which I've actually had on, on hold for a little while because I messed it up just mildly. But I've been trying to solve that problem, uh, you know, so, but it's, it's ready to be undercoated now. So I'll be going into that very, very soon. Uh, basically I, I lost a, a piece a very small <laughs> very small piece that you never ever see but it's very very significant um, so yeah I have to make that piece basically um, oh, I've got a cat here on my airbrush get off it's actually stuck in the <laughs> my cat gets everywhere shall I just take that off because it stops it clocking up I've, so much I've started to have I've, I now have a dog which is fantastic oh I yeah of course week, yeah we did um, how is she? Yeah, and she's doing oh my she is a different dog already. Uh, we've had Wonderful. two weeks as a, a rescue. First week was very nervous. This week oh, she's just being a puppy and it's fantastic to get fantastic seeing that she gets to be like that after what she's been through. So it's been lovely, but now there is a dog hair everywhere. She's uh she's quite long haired, so yeah. Getting used is to she that long again. hair from the photo I saw that she was quite short or was she just had a haircut? Uh, it, she's she's very smooth looking, so it doesn't look like she's long haired, but she's got a lot of uh, sort of Alsatian German Shepherd in her. I could see that in, actually, in yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now you're saying, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it does. Uh, and as the owner of a long haired cat, I'll tell you how to remedy do that after the show. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, what are you Jeff doing? Said, oh, go on, oh, go on. I say Jeff just said staining and dry brushing works okay on the small scale tanks, which is great because that's my wheelhouse of painting. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's going to play right, in, right into your um, yeah. into your field there, isn't it? Perfect. <laughs> Sorry, what are you going to say there? Dan? I was just about to say. So, if you're not painting your T34 right now, uh, rather than just yeah. chatting away, what are you actually doing? Uh, I'm watching you paint. Oh, I thought I thought you were doing something. I thought you were making stuff or painting I had, stuff. I have pulled uh, pulled out some assault incisors to carry on building they're almost finished just got the last little bit to do on them but i'm intrigued again haven't seen much airbrushing and i appreciate it is a very different skill to even what i first thought it was i didn't realize 
how much skill went into airbrushing, how you vet those different variables to using it all at the same time and stuff. So I, uh, I keep finding myself mesmerised watching airbrushing, which I never thought were, were words that would come out of my mouth, but they have. <laughs> um, no, it is. It's really interesting. Yeah, so it's been a little bit tight. I've been handling it a bit too much, and there's, there's a little bit of paint starting to come off on some of the corners now. So I'm just trying to be careful with it. Because obviously, I'll be uh, painting mine with brushes. But yeah. I can already see uh, exactly how I'm going to go about it, having to you with the airbrush just going in darker where I've got I mean, those shadows before yeah I and you don't have to get you don't have to get these modulation sets either you can just go oh I'm gonna get the Soviet green and if you go to uh, you know ammo mig or AK interactive or um, Vallejo or even the Citadel Rangers just pick up those colors that are, are close to what you want or are exactly what you want you know Citadel don't do um, realistic stuff they do stuff that is very high fantasy um, so they're gonna be bright colors often quite you know cheerful colors if that makes sense um, but yeah, yeah, you, you can get wherever you want. Yeah. You can make it. And pink I, I thought this would be a really nice way to get away from the Citadel range. Um, it's a real nice segue. Yeah, because yeah, I'm moving away from those types of models where you do tend to want those brighter colours uh, and have those contrasts, and to go to a bit more realism to look into another paint brand as well. Um, so I was thinking maybe Army Painter or. Like that, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, do something okay. completely different, and you get the opportunity then to talk about it on this show. That'd be great. Um, so yeah, what right. we were talking about just, just at the end of the, just before the end of the intermission, we were talking about the game Infinity, weren't we? It's a game that we both yes. know about, but we've never played it. Um, yeah. it's, I don't know heaps. I don't. I'm not deep on the lore or anything like that with it. But from what I've heard about it, it's a very well thought out game. It's meant to be very tactical, tactically balanced. So it comes down to the players rather than there being of metas which yeah, gets talked about a lot in sort of warhammer yeah which armies are currently stronger what builds are stronger um and people playing those um it's, yeah it just seems really interesting i have looked at the the rule book very very quickly just flick through it and it's a very detailed game but it's so free it reminds me of yeah it's free it's all there all the rule books for all their editions all the add-ons they you never pay for a rule book that's great bit. And they, they look like they're very active on bringing out new content, new mission Excellent. packs, all sorts of things like that. It's fantastic. It reminds me a little bit of, because it's a smaller scale, it, it's, it's sort of a big skirmish game. Um, I think it's just basically 28mm, but it's not heroic 28mm, because 40k, for example, is what is known as heroic for, uh, 28 heroic for, heroic 28mm, which is basically 32 or 35 um, yeah, if, if you were to get 28mm uh, bolt action tank and put it beside <laughs> one of uh, the, the 40k ones, the, the size Land is completely Raider. different, but they are yeah. the same scale, and you're like, what happened there? Um, yeah. So, yeah. Scale is important, it? it is. And that's, that's fine. You thought about having yeah. just these crazy yeah. fantasy units and stuff. But, uh, and that's think... what you want. You want it to be crazy. Yeah. Because it's space soldiers <laughs> and space wizards and stuff. I want it. To, I want it to be mental. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm really interested in it because it plays into my fan base of um, synthwave, and I really want to kind of play with some. Yeah, I want to play with some of the the miniatures that they've got, just to paint them and do them in some outrageous kind of 80s style synth colours, like the purples and the blues and the turquoises. First, um, first idea I get is imagine painting them sort of that empty ski wear yeah yes um, yeah, exactly that crazy contrast in pinks and purples and greens and you just type in just... synthwave into google images and yeah. just see the stuff that comes up cool. uh, yeah uh, that leads me actually into to remembering that on instagram one of our followers on instagram is uh, a, a member called a big brad the big bad brush um, and i did say that i would help the big bad brush out because they are based in sydney in australia which is obviously right on the other side of the world from us but this is about the community and support in that effort uh, they've just set up their own um, gaming shop so you know if you're into the oh, hobby fantastic. and you're in this little place in, it's on the side of Sydney then it's just set, it's called Dice Arcade and it's all uh, the, the logo is all done in that synth wave uh, retro style it looks really really good and he says it's just every hobbyist dream he's been really really lucky to kind of get it I said I don't know if there's anything I can really do with our small but loyal base over here in, in the UK oh. um, but anything yeah. that I, anything that I can do is you know whatever so I said I'd give him a mention yeah, it just kind of it reminded me because it was synthwave. 
I, but... uh, I used to live in Sydney. I've lived there. Oh, yeah, of course. Some time there. Absolutely loved living in Sydney. It was fantastic. In fact, I remember I walked in. This wasn't in Sydney. This is in Cairns in Australia, so several thousand miles up the coast. But I walked into a games workshop, and this was before I'd gotten back into it, just before I started working for sort of PGL. And I walked back in, just just saw one on the high street. I was like, oh, my God, I haven't been into one of these for years. Walked in, got chatting with the guy there. It was absolutely fantastic. We had a great chat about how much more expensive playing the hobby is in Australia. It is, yeah. It's, it's absolutely crazy. He did let me into a little secret that um, Australian armed forces can claim their miniatures back on tax. Which is lovely. Um, which is, I think, a great idea. It um, is. And then he gave me he gave me a unit of Sanguinary Guard. <gasps> is that the Sanguinary Guard that you've got there now? It is not, unfortunately. Uh... I held on to them for 18 months of backpacking um, or on the sprue. And then just it must have been months before I was due to come home, I lost them when I moved, and I was absolutely gutted. Ah, oh, such a shame. I couldn't wait. I was like, that. It's gonna be such a nice thing to do when I get home and I'm kind of recovering from jet lag. That's that's what I remember having in my head. That's gonna be a little project. And to remember the holiday and the nice gentleman that gave them to you. Yeah. It, there'd been some sort of event on, and they were just left over. And he went, do you know what? Just to help you get back in the hobby, because it. it having that chat seems like you miss it and it'd be great to get back into it they gave me the two sprues that makes up the sanguinary guard box set and i was like oh my gosh thank you so much and yeah i had to i remember i had to move out of a hostel at about half four in the morning and try not to wake everybody up turning the lights on just just missed them didn't realize they'd come out the bag Fair i'm so sorry such a shame human. yeah that would have been a great story to tell people as well when I'm setting them up on the on the table. But oh well, it wasn't to be, man. <laughs> wasn't to be. <laughs> um, another thing I just reminded myself of just one of those random things that I found when I was um, just perusing the internet just earlier today. Uh, I found another paint company that I'm I'm quite interested in in exploring. They're a, U, a US company. Uh, they don't ship directly to customers in this country um, at the moment, but they do have stockists over here, two or three of them. There's a, a company called Turbo Dork, if you're interested in looking at all the different types of paints you can get out of there. And they specifically do synthwave style metallics, etc. So if you want to go and have an explore with colour shifting paints or just really retro colours and schemes or whatever, head on over and have a look at Turbo Dork. They're absolutely incredible. I will do a bit of a feature on them in the future and talk about them a bit more perhaps. Maybe even buy some. I might get like some Infinity models perhaps and do some up. Um, I have thought about just buying a Porsche 911 uh, like 28 millimeter Porsche yeah. 911 and just doing it up synthwave because it's the kind of iconic it 80s. It is the synthwave. Car, it is, isn't it? it? So I thought, yeah, yeah. Do you know what? I might, I might actually have a go at that. But this show is all about getting everything done that you have already. <laughs> Not getting more things. Yeah. <laughs> well, it also kind of is. <laughs> yeah, of course it is. <laughs> I've just spent over 100 pounds on stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. Talk about shopping lists. Um, do you know who I always thought would go well in a synthwave pattern? Eldar. Just those the, the the bikes, the grab tanks, just those big planes. You see some great airbrush work with fading colours and things like that with the yeah. the Eldar vehicles. And I've just always thought synth wave. I've talked talked to you before. I think we might have mentioned it on this show, but that Tron style Eldar, that great that look really classic good. Tron. Um, is it eighties? Tron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You try, yeah, yeah. The original, the original one is. Yeah, um, and just yeah, an Eldar in that style. It just goes. Yeah, I agree. There's a part of me that wants to suggest that maybe Tau would be, but I've actually seen a lot of evidence to the contrary. Uh, I've got uh, some of my like um, uh, image files which I use for inspiration or kind of going back to, like, oh, how did they do this? How did they achieve that? And right in the middle of it is this um, battle suit. It's just gritty, uh, high, you know, um, grime uh, and dust, uh, and it re you know, a, a heavy dry brushing effects and whatever, and just a couple of light sources on it. And I'm like, actually, that really grimy dirty dark look very much like what you're trying to do with your uh, blood angels and doing very well by the way um Thank you. i Slow think really sure. really suits the towel and i would have thought that maybe the brighter colors because we all know that they're based off of anime we all know that they kind of come from that japanese uh yeah. sort of manga influence and things like that uh, but actually the grimier dirty grittier i've actually called it gritty towel uh, as, as an image 
um, so I can find it in a pinch. Uh, but it's, 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 a, it's an astonishing little uh, miniature. Um, yeah, I really like the Tower Battle Suits. I have thought about getting some to kind of play with, but this show is all about <laughs> getting through what you've already got. I mean, I've got some Tau um, that are going to just sit there. I've got six Battle Suits that aren't even primed. So if you just want one to play around with, or even a unit, in fact, you bought me some, I sent you the money because you saw some for me. They are still sat there. Oh, ideal. Maybe, maybe I'll have a go. Yeah, yeah. It's funny because just so before, just up. before this show started, uh, or was it actually right back in the first couple of episodes, a friend of mine, because we were out of lockdown, actually brought me some Necron models. So I've got some Necrons to play with oh. as well. Um, but yeah, I, I was just trying to get through uh, my existing, um, my existing <laughs> no, tanks and, <laughs> and, and Tyranids, etc., uh, before I get too caught up in that. It would be lovely well, to have I, a go. If I send you my unpainted models, and then your unpainted models, and I've got less unpainted models? Is that yeah, how that works? I think getting yeah, rid of the hobby way. isn't getting through <laughs> the hobby, is it? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a technicality, and I'll take it at this point. Um, I know for a fact that Mellabrook, watching us today, is currently painting up his Eldar um, and actually has been painting up uh, Wind Riders and Vipers, etc. And has recently acquired some War Walkers from uh, a gentleman on eBay who wanted to get rid of some uh, pre-built uh, kind of models, etc. Um, and they've been like, I think they've been like dry, uh, under... Undercoat. I'm really struggling with my words today. They've been undercoated red, and they look really cool. They've got a few breaks on them, whatever, but nothing that can't be hidden very, very easily. Um, so best of luck to painting those. Would love to see some photos of all that Eldar when they're done. Um, Eldar, of course, are my uh, regular opponent. Um, so yeah, it'll be, it'll be really interesting to see them. Uh, I've never I'm actually looking out on eBay for an attack bike. I think <sighs> they're such an old school model, but. It just suits the crusade idea I've got that everything has to move fast. And it, it was works. a discussion that came up on one of the um, 40k forums on um, Facebook just earlier on uh, this morning, I think it was. Someone saying like, hey, what, does anybody remember the attack bike? Does anybody think it's still got a place? And I was going to get involved in that conversation, but I was preparing for today's show, so I didn't bother. But yeah, I, I was think... never a fan of the bikes or the attack bikes or whatever, but if you like them, you like them, right? They got a lot of love. It's, it's one of the first models I remember buying for my Blood Angels back in the day, so it's kind of got that nostalgic sort of feel to it, but uh, sort of coming from the game-wise, they've got a little, there's a new sort of lease of life to them, because of the changing rules for bikes, they don't suffer from the penalty to hit when moving now, ah. uh, with heavy weapons. So I know that, obviously because I've played the game now, that they've hmm. reintroduced the whole squad penalty for um, your heavy weapon element um, shooting. Sorry, moving. So if you're, yeah, if, if, if anyone in the squad now moves, your heavy weapon in that squad fires at minus one ballistic skill, which is something that they went away with in the previous edition, uh, which I really liked, but they decided to bring that back in there. There's a lot of, uh, when, you, when you start getting into the game, you start looking at the rules and how they kind of put it all together, you go like, oh, I see why they've done that. That makes up for this, this, and this. But uh, I, I miss it. I miss being able to walk along merrily and shoot with my <laughs> heavy weapon because Timo, but because Tim over there has decided the move, I've got to shoot uh, less accurately. But yeah, whatever. Hey, it's their game. They can make it what they want, right? They've changed that the squad cohesion as well to stop people sort of conga lining, I've noticed as well, which is I've... a shame. It's such an important thing for Blood Angels to get all your <laughs> to get all the buffs off. I um, recall a tournament that I played in some years ago. It wasn't an official tournament; it was a tournament that I was running, um, and, and I was playing in it as well. And I would have um, people that would you know adjudicate my games for fairness. And um, there was a game where the for me to win it I had to make a conga line and it was a conga line of destiny I was holding a center objective with a tactical squad of space marines um, and on the side of the board in a building was an opponent's dreadnought that was opposing another tactical thing another um, strategic location that I was already holding um, but I had to destroy I had to get rid of them otherwise they were going to make it a draw and I was very competitive at that point in the game so um, I made this giant conga line and you can't if anyone's never played it before you, you can't have one squad hold two locations I think you can now but back then you couldn't and um, I made this giant conga line and right at the end of it I had a melter gun which is basically a fusion gun is a high heat weapon it's like a paint stripper on steroids um, and I had to uh, shoot it through a window at maximum 
maximum range. I had to roll stupid dice or whatever to hit this dreadnought, which was revealed by the smallest amount through a window. And I hit it and I blew it up. It exploded all over the couple of guys that were uh, holding that objective. They made their insane dice rolls to save it. It was I was literally on my knees with my hands on my head going, I can't believe I'm just about to do this. Obviously, my opponent was very upset with me for doing this extreme tactic, but it won me the game. And in a big tournament, that's a big deal. Uh, and now you can't do that. So yeah, you have to have at least two of your uh, units, or two, or two models within a unit within this certain cohesion thing. And it makes you not bunch up, but it stops you stretching out so far. Like you're saying, that conga line is really important. Yeah. It, you saw it so much in the last edition with Blood Angels, just just conga lining back to get all of their character buffs. So you could get all these like multi buff. Yeah. Uh, effects because How... th that synergy is so important to blood angels um and the fact they've changed character targeting that you have to within three inches of a unit now uh to not be targeted i think is another good change because it sometimes you're like but that person's just stood out right in the open why can't i shoot him um so it makes a lot more sense now i'm happy with that yeah, sniper guns, sniper weapons basically now have the advantage to be able to target characters at any time, um, yeah. which makes them so much more potent because they fell uh, really foul of um, not being very good, basically, in, in recent editions. But now now they are. They can be again. Again, it goes back, and this is kind of why I want to get... I'd like to try Infinity. I remember when Warhammer, especially Warhammer Fantasy, it was complicated. There were a lot of rules. You had to read that rule book cover to cover to know how to play the game. Uh, and the basic rules now there, and I do like this, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not saying this is a negative thing. They've, they've simplified the game. Um, it yes, they've streamlined it. It's much more streamlined. But I, I also like a complicated game. I do. It's what drew me to Warhammer Fantasy. Uh, Warhammer Fantasy in the start, all your four meta, all your sort of rank bonuses, and changing shapes of your squads, and all the magic, and all the different properties of weapons and all these things and it looks like infinity has that Very yeah warhammer second second edition back in the 90s is when i first came into it. it was a very complicated game and if you played large games it would take you eight nine hours to play a game it's ridiculous but it wasn't made to be a massive war game it was a skirmish game take a couple of squads with a character and a tank or a dreadnought um, and that's all you really needed to take and the game was complicated and in depth you could play it large if you wanted to i always did because i was young and i quite liked the abuse i suppose yeah. um but yeah yeah like like you say now the, the game is much more streamlined which i, I value and you know yeah. very much the same as yourself it. yeah 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 um there's a, there's yeah, a lot of it. there's a lot of things in it that make sense now like grenades were always kind of pointless but now they kind of have a bit more to them yeah yeah I see what you're saying yeah. infinity uh, and, again you spoke about it so much but a lot of people uh, that have been speaking to are really happy that it's they put a lot of effort into the narrative side of the game again and that it's becoming popular again yeah it's but, um but also the pitfalls like you it's hard to just completely step away from being competitive you're so used to taking things and putting those combinations together to be strong yeah, and taking that step back and going, oh, is that the narrative choice? Uh, it, it, it can be quite tough, actually, when you do yeah. get used to sort of like. Well, that's what my opponent is. said to me when I was playing. It's like, why, why did you take zone threats so if you know they're going to be such a, a heavy, sluggish unit? It's like, oh, because they're cool. And he's like, okay, cheers. <laughs> that was yeah. it. That was, that was the only reason I took them is because I liked them and I spent a lot of time yeah. recently painting them on the show. Yeah. You know, I put a lot of effort into them. And I just kind of wanted to have a go with it, so yeah, I did. Um, it worked against me, but they looked cool on the on the on the tabletop. Um, do you know the thing that was the most devastating was the spore mines. <laughs> the spore mines were the spore mines were brilliant. Oh, in the first likes them, in really. the first game, I took I took just two units of three of them just to kind of have them there, and they were a great distraction. Um, or sorry, was it one unit? And in the second game, because I had some spare, I had two units of three and was able to kind of make the initial... And I got... I wasn't first turn on, on both the games. So it made the uh, the opponent's first two... The fir first turns uh, had to decide between, oh, well, I want to move over there, but as soon as I do, these spore mines are going to explode in my face and they're super dangerous. Um, and then I also had the Biovore launching them in from the back and they were just just breaking up units all the time. It was fantastic. And there was one that fired right into the middle of this um, area terrain, basically a giant ruined building that we were most of the fighting was happening in. Um, it missed, so it just kind of landed there. 
I was having a fight which I didn't want to have with um, some Howling Banshees, which are close combat specialists, and they were making very short work of my uh, my very limited amount of shooting capability. Uh, and I was going to be entrenched, and I, there was no way out of it. Um, so he disengaged from those guys, took shots at them with their pistols, missed, um, and then took one more shot with them, hit it, and then the only way that I was going to walk away from it is if I rolled a triple six to save it, which I then rolled. <laughs> I, I remember as I ro rolling the dice, I was thinking, am I actually, what are the chances? Am I actually going to get three sixes? Oh, look, three sixes. <laughs> um, my opponent then was ripping their hair out, which I understand, I get it. I apologize for my roll. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, that then went to charge into the back of the Howling Banshees and killed uh, a, a good 60% of them uh, just from one little spore mine and a cluster of three of them costs me one point. So <laughs> yeah, uh, they, they were really worth, worth their weight in gold. So in future games, I'm thinking we're taking larger swarms of them because they cost virtually nothing. So yeah, if if you're a tuner player, have a go with spore mines if you haven't already. They're cracking. Absolutely love them. Um, I may get this wrong because I, I have had a couple of of beers throughout the evening, but I believe that's a one in two hundred and sixteen chance of you pulling that that save off. Uh, yes, my opponent actually pointed that out to me uh, just oh, earlier I'm on. Glad. So um, I'm glad our maths uh, worked out between yeah, us. I'm yeah, yeah. I, I, I <laughs> let the world know that I played the lottery that night. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't win. <laughs> um, I, clearly, I'd used up all my good luck on that roll, but it was a great game. We had we had a fantastic time. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about a little bit just before we start because we're getting quite close to the end of the thing here is oh, yeah. the end of the show yeah I wanted to talk about um, how people paint their models because as, as I mentioned um, uh, my uh, friend has uh, bought these Eldar models from this person on eBay um, they are pre-built and they've been undercoated it's not too much effort to kind of do your own thing with them but I was wondering what what is the general approach with people when they're painting and pre-assembly etc i'm asking because my 135th panther is all pretty much ready to go but there's a lot of stowage and gear and stuff that i haven't even cut off the sprue yet because i'm going to paint them before they actually go onto the tank and i wonder if that is the general thing do people just put their models together paint them on the sprue which i see a lot of people doing but then when you cut them off that leaves a little hole that you've then got to cut. what what is the general thing i i bet there's going to be like a, a the, the largest amount of everyone's going to be um i like to you know cut them all off and build them as much as i can paint them and then put their guns on or whatever but I, I bet there are some people that do it in a very different way and i'm just kind of interested to see what that general consensus is what do you do kyle do you do, do full pre-assembly I get excited like the little child that I am and make the model completely, everything goes on it, I get super excited by it and then I curse myself when I try and paint in between the weapons and all the hard to reach areas, but I just can't help myself, I do it every time. <laughs> I, I used to do it as well because I knew I, I never really got round to painting, but now that I am in a better place with my painting. I've, even with my intercessors, I've kept the helmets off. I've never done that before. Nice. I've always made the model fully. But I realised, especially with painting yellow, I don't want them on the models. Uh, so I stuck them to some chopsticks so I could paint them and then stick them on afterwards. So that is the most I've ever sort of done it in phases, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, because all your helmets are very different colours, aren't they, for yes. your units? Yeah. That's kind of an important aspect of their identity. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's cool. I was wondering if other people, uh, Adrian here, saying uh, part assemble and then paint as you go. Uh, not sp uh, no spot remains unpainted. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly how I like to do it as well. Just wondering if there's someone out there who's got like kind of these key recipes. Like, no, try this. It's really cool. So, Carl, uh, just before the end of the show here. Um, I'm actually quite tired of the amount of talking I've done today. Uh, <laughs> I apologise for anyone who's been trying to keep up with me. I'm talking a million miles an hour. And I've been stumbling over my words a lot. Like I say, I do I do stammer. Um, so I'm, I'm just about to finish this thing now. Uh, I've, I've worked my way up through those different colours. I mean, he looks a little bit brighter than the um, than the Firefly tank that's with him. But that's because this one... <laughs> it's got a little bit of dust on his back there. Um, it's because with this one... Over the top of all the highlights and the shadows, I did a really thin layer, like I do with all my tanks, of that kind of mid-colour, that, that main colour that goes with them. So this one is the olive drab. Um, I've got to kind of water down, and I'm just going to give them a really thin sort of thin layer over the top, like a watered down wash, if you like. Just spraying it on over the top. Now, if you're painting by brush, that's something that you can't really do. 
Um, so you might want to consider getting some sort of thinners or something like that if you wanted to and then kind of wash it over. You can do it with water, but it's a bit harder to control. Um, of course, if you're just going to paint it one colour, have fun with that. So this will blend all of those um, transitions in a little bit. So where there are like some hard block browns to you know, hard block like highlights or whatever, it'll kind of just bring them all together and just kind of lend that olive drab tone to the whole model and hopefully it will hide those bits where i've been touching the kind of wet paint a little bit and we'll bring the main color back to olive so what's your next step because obviously that's sort of the block color done is it then washes and yeah so it goes on, on to basically weathering and yeah you know, and details details I, I would just consider is um uh, sticking like a, a little wash over it into the panels and things at this scale is very it, there's no point in going like, i'm going to do this tiny little detail this tiny little detail so you could just kind of wipe it across but you know fi find that find the pace of that particular model right every, mo every, a, every model has its own pace there's a lot of rivets on this uh, not a lot there's some riveting I'm thinking oh, about maybe... how riveting oh <laughs> i know so such, such a pun yeah <laughs> just thinking yeah about some uh, some washes there i'm gonna go about it so i use a lot of enamel washes for my um world war ii stuff uh and they're, they're all um interchangeable between the different things because it's all just kind of grime colors not like a camo specific colors so um you basically they're all thinned down with uh, enamel thinner or spirits so the idea is you put a really really thin layer of spirit base over the top of it all you might want to varnish it to kind of protect it put this thin layer over the top then apply your enamel washes and then you can kind of just wipe them away and blend them and then they leave some really nice effects afterwards and then yeah. varnish over the top if you like um the advantage with um using thinners uh, sorry like enamels and whatever is that it doesn't affect the acrylic base underneath but your brushing may weather the, or it may remove the um, acrylic base so it is always worth in my mind before you move on to a uh, weathering process to always um give it like a matte varnish or as i've learned recently a satin varnish because it makes it much more controllable which is why i bought satin varnish yeah so i think kyle i'm there just nice. just spotting him over there are a couple of errors and things on him that i will when the light's a little bit brighter tomorrow i'll probably come in here and just spend five minutes just neating them up let me just purge the brush out a minute uh i'll just stick some cleaner through here because i could put cleaner in now because i bought loads of it yeah yeah i know right just purge that through and then I'll, I'll i'll present him to you Cool, wonderful. Right, let's pop that pot over there. Here we are. So, this is my little Matilda in my very much not African campaign colours. <laughs> and beside it is the Firefly, which you're going to see in a couple of seconds, clearly. Yes. The Matilda's a little bit lighter. That's just because when I've been painting the summer round, I was uh, probably heavier with the highlights, etc. But I don't mind them all being different because every tank was individual, even if they had the same colour scheme. They were painted very often by the crew, very crudely, ad hoc, in the middle of, um, you know, probably a, not in the necessarily middle of a fight, but right beside one. Um, so yeah, I'm really happy with that. And when I put the washes and the weathering on them, they're gonna they're gonna look really really nice. Uh, if I pop those beside some of the German armour here's my tiger the scale you can see how big he is this fella here being at the top is the, is the matilda i can bring in one of my favorites is the, the Pan, panzer IV. that's my favorite one there always like a panzer IV. lovely really happy with that so i'm looking oh, sorry, forward sorry, I'm, I'm still just waiting for him to pop up yeah sure of course you German are armor. <laughs> yeah i I'm, I'm really happy with it I know it took me two hours, a whole show, to paint it and just do some very basic colours on there, but I just like the process of the airbrush and, and I enjoy that side of it. I enjoy the hobby um, and just kind of working through the motions. It doesn't get me through models very quickly, but if I had, and we spoke about this before, if I had four or five of them, I'd probably have them all done in, in near enough the same um, same sort of time because you're kind of doing those colours on, you know, in, on, on block 
So yeah, really enjoyed it. It's a really nice tank. He is super tiny. She is, I suppose, Matilda, right? Um, super, super tiny. Um, but I'll be interested to see how it performs in games. And I'm hoping to have some games soon. Who knows? Maybe, maybe with you. Maybe we get out of this this lockdown. So yeah, can you see him yet? Yes. Yeah, I can see him all. Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is tiny, isn't it? Compared to, uh... Yeah, especially this beast here, uh, the, yeah. the tiger. Um, I don't know if the Matilda River was would have been around where the tigers were. I mean, obviously the tiger uh, featured a little bit over in North Africa, um, but then over in the Eastern Front fighting against um, the Soviets, uh, because like Adrian said earlier on, um, the Germans encountered the T-34, which was their response to a lot of the German armor over there, the Panzer IVs, etc. Um, but then they realized that they had an a sloped armor, so they went ahead and designed the Panther, which is a beast of a tank. It is, I know that it's um, the smaller partner, if you like, to the Tiger, uh, especially its armament, but it is an enormous tank that's down in front of it. It is the size of a bungalow. It really is. Um, and it, there's there's a lot of uh, discussion that kind of goes into is the Panther probably one of the better tanks of the Second World War? Uh, it also stands on the edge of being um, a medium tank to a heavy tank. They didn't they you know, no one really knows how to classify it, and there are different versions of it as well. Uh, this one here actually has uh, the later uh, turret mantlet, which is where it's got rather than having like a, a curved underside to it, it actually has like a little step to help prevent shells going in there and there were lots of little additions that went into it uh, i think this is panther type d uh my 35th and uh, 135th sort of scale is a uh, panther g so it's very late war uh, but this thing w was was incredible it, it had the very similar um front armor to the t-34 which i think the t-34 has uh 50 degrees 30 degrees of um, slope and the Panther has just, just a little bit behind it and it basically just increases the effective um, thickness of the armor which is just insane on these tanks um, yeah so that was their kind of response to the T-34 and then the Tigers were all, almost uh, I don't think the Americans ever really they might have seen like one or two but they um, yeah they, they never really saw them over there so that tank that you see in Fury was very unlikely for it to happen and that gets talked about a lot especially in um, you know people specialists in the field talk about how unrealistic that fight was but if you've ever seen the film Fury I don't care if it was unrealistic because it was cool as it was a really really good really good film uh, I enjoyed it cool sometimes has to win doesn't it yeah of course it does it's a film it's there to entertain um yeah so that's my little bit on on the matilda tank today um next week i'll do a little bit of weathering on it i want to talk about um some weathering pencils have been a request um off the show to, uh, i've got some like streaking and rust effects here uh, i do a lot of my streaking rust effects with enamel paints i pick these up to have a go with them i struggled a lot to use these so i'm quite keen to give them another shot and i've had some requests saying hey can you do something with the pencils so i'll get these out next week and have a little look at these while carl you're obviously going to be doing what i've done this week next yes. week yeah cool exactly. um yeah and then hopefully we'll be able to see each other properly and if you want to you can have a go with all my weathering stuff here if we have the opportunity to wonderful well there we go that brings us pretty much neatly to the end of our show today um, i've had a great time sitting here painting away it's been much more relaxed um uh, adrian's put in just towards the end here uh, the later marks of the panther were regarded as the best tanks of world war ii the early versions not so much yes uh, they had some teething issues with them uh, but as Kyle and I were talking about just before we um, just before we went live today, that they were just so over and just literally just Google um, Panther torsion bars and you'll get a, a small taste into the um, engineering that went into these things. They were so tight for space in such a large tank, they couldn't even have hatches on the, on the underside. It was incredible. Um, anyway um that's pretty much everything that i've got for today we've we, i think we've wrapped up quite neatly today is there anything that you wanted to talk about mention or or do before we sign off today kyle i just want to say thank you for everyone for being here i really genuinely it is the little light at the end of my week he says it he says here. it every week doesn't he yeah then? it genuinely is though um I, I love even if some weeks I'm, I'm not able to paint it is just nice to come on have a chat with everyone uh, and just know just know there are other people out there yeah man we're all here same. supporting you from the yeah. side <laughs> yeah cool <laughs> all right well um 
thanks for everyone for coming along being a part of episode 13 uh, a nice little turnout as well uh, we will be here next week from 7pm to 9pm live as we always are uh, so from me I've been Danny and I've been Kyle he has been I pointed in the right direction this time it's hit or miss every week it really is um, I've had a cracking time I hope you've enjoyed it uh, if you have enjoyed what we do of course like follow and please do subscribe uh, and I will see you next week take care for now see you soon cheers bye oh was another good show there mate loved it thank you that was that's the most I've used my, my degree since I graduated so <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> you'll be fine find a use for it mate yeah